Baby Island, Chapter 5, Time and Tide. The girls went along the beach because, as Mary said, if there was a stream anywhere on the island, it would be sure to run down to the sea. Besides, they could go more quickly and safely on the beach than in the tangled undergrowth of the inner island. I hate awfully to go and leave the babies alone like this, said Mary as they hastened along, but it seemed the only way. Yes, said Jean, we shouldn't get along very fast carrying four fat babies. It's too bad we didn't get shipwrecked with a nice automobile, or at least a pony in a cart. But shipwrecks are so unexpected. You never know what you're going to need until it's too late. They soon forgot everything else in wonder and admiration as new stretches of beach opened out before them. A short distance from the spot where their boat landed, a ridge of rocks broke through the sand and straggled down into the sea. When they had clambered up on top of this, they could see more beach and rocks ahead, and here and there clumps of palm trees leading out toward the sea. There ought to be coconuts in those palm trees, if I remember my geography, said Mary, but oh dear, oh dear, the trunks are so tall and slippery looking, I don't know how we'll ever get them. About their feet in the crevices of the rocks were little pools of seawater, and Jean often exclaimed over some funny crab or sea creature. Oh, Mary, she cried, do you suppose that we could find clams for a clam bake, or lobsters Newburg, or Finn and Hattie, or something like that? I expect so, said Mary. Nothing would surprise me now that we're on a desert island. The sun grew hotter as they went along, and it seemed as if they had walked miles before they saw anything but sand and rocks and sea. At last, however, they saw yellow cliffs rising at the edge of the beach. Well, they look different anyway. Let's run for them and see what we can find. They raced along the beach until they reached the cliffs and dropped down panting in a welcome shade of overhanging rocks. I have an idea, said Mary. Do you see that turn in the cliffs right ahead? We can't see what's around that corner, so let's make a game of it. Let's shut our eyes when we get to the turn and walk 10 steps without looking. Then we'll open our eyes and see what we find. We have been lucky so far. Perhaps we'll be lucky again. So, forgetting their weariness, the two girls got up again and went to the turn of the cliffs. Just before they got to the place where they would be able to look around the bend and see what was ahead of them, they closed their eyes, took hold of hands, and started forward across the smooth sand. One, two, three, four, five. Ouch! Jean stepped her toe, but she did not open her eyes. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, open. They both looked about them. There was no sound or sight of bubbling brook, but in the side of the cliff was something which made them forget their need of water and the excitement of discovery. It's a cave, Mary. Jean, it's a cave. They caught each other around the waist and executed a couple of dizzy whirls. When they had sobered down a little, Jean said, Do we dare go in? Of course we do. It looks pretty dark and scary. I guess William Wallace wouldn't have been scared. The two girls went softly over to the mouth of the cave, tiptoeing as if they expected to find something lurking within. But when their eyes grew accustomed to the shadows, it seemed to be quite empty. It had a smooth sand floor that looked as if it had just been scrubbed. They stepped across the threshold, and suddenly the noise of the sea on the beach seemed much farther away. It gave them a cozy feeling of security. Jean, said Mary, maybe we could live here. The clean sand floor stretched back some distance to the rough and irregular wall. They had to stoop a little to enter, but once inside, they could easily stand erect. It's kind of clammy, said Jean. Yes, it is. It might give Jonah the colic. That would be awful. But at least, said Mary, we'd have a roof over our heads and a cool shelter from the sun in the hot part of the day. I wish I had a drinking fountain in it, said Jean. You're right, Jean. We haven't found our fresh water yet, have we? But I believe that we have gone as far as we ought to go today. Well, we have enough water in the jug to last a few more days if we're careful. Let's go back to the babies now. It seemed a longer way back than it had been to come, but there was so much to talk about that they chattered gaily as they went along. Mary was full of housewifely plans for the furnishing of their new home, and Jean began to make up one of her nonsense songs. 
Oh, I'm going to rave about a cave we found on Baby Island. It's nice and warm in case of storm, and Jean and Mary found it. Oh, Jean and Mary live in caves because they're Baby Island slaves. And they rode on the billowy, willowy waves to get to Baby Island. Suddenly, Jean stopped singing and said, Why, Mary, the beach isn't as wide as it was when you came by here before. I remember this place in particular. Why, I believe the sea is getting higher. How could it, said Mary. But Mary, it has. Where are the little pools that we saw among the rocks? And where are the tracks we made in the sand when we came by here before? You are right, said Mary, with a sudden chill of fear. We are walking just as near the sea as we did before, but we're walking higher up. Yes, sir, cried Jean emphatically. The water has covered our tracks, Mary. Oh, what do you suppose makes it? Suddenly, Mary began to run. I know what it is. It's the tide. Oh, the tide is coming in. The babies are alone. Oh, my darling babies. The tide, gasped Jean. Running behind Mary, she tried to remember what she had read about the tide in the big geography at school. The moon was like a big magnet, she remembered, drawing the water of the ocean towards itself and causing the ebb and flow of tides on the beaches the world round. But she had never thought how terrible it would be to see it come, each wave rushing a little further as if it meant to swallow the land altogether. There was something about it in her old grammar book too. Time and tide wait for no man. That's what it said. And the babies, four little babies alone in a boat that had been high and dry when they left it. Where would it be now? The girls wasted no more time breathing on talking. They put all their strength into running as they had never run before. Panting and stumbling over rocks and sand, they somehow managed to keep going. Such a long way it seemed now. Why had they come so far and left the babies alone? Jean needed to sing Scott Swahili with Wallace Blood very much just now, but even more, she needed her breath and strength for running. Mary's legs were a little longer than hers, and like time and tide, Mary waited for no man. It was all Jean could do to keep up with her. At last, they saw ahead of them the ridge of rocks that jutted out into the sea. On the other side of that, was the beach where they had left the babies. Mary gave a little groan of anguish and relief. It was a relief to see that they were almost there, and yet she was so frightened that she scarcely dared to look to see if the babies were safe. She scrambled to the top of the ridge of rocks, paused there an instant, and cried hoarsely, There! There they are, Jean! Jean looked, too, for a fleeting instant before she began to rush down the other side. The boat, which they had struggled so valiantly to pull high and dry on the beach that morning, was floating far out in the water. It was bobbing gently with every wave that came in, but something seemed to be keeping it anchored in one spot. It's the tarp, gasped Mary. The good old tarpaulin has anchored it. And my safety pins, croaked Jean. Sure enough, the stakes which they had driven deep in the sand that morning still stood firm and the tarpaulin tent held the boat safely moored to the stakes so that it couldn't drift out to sea. As they drew near, they heard a chorus of shouts from the frightened babies. For a moment, the two girls paused at the water's edge, wondering what to do. Then Mary Wallace stepped out into the frothy water and began splashing and floundering through the waves toward the boat. Mary, you know you can't swim, warned Jean in a frightened voice. But nothing could stop Mary now until her babies were safe. The twins saw her coming and began to bounce themselves, shouting, Mimi, Mimi, Mimi is coming, darling, she called. Then the blue twin remembered how he had climbed over the side of the boat to follow Jean that morning. And seeing his beloved Mimi coming, he decided to try it again. Jean saw him swing his fat legs over the side of the boat and screamed a warning to Mary. Then splash! He had lost his balance and toppled over the side into the water. The water was up to Mary's armpits as she reached the boat, but she ducked down after Blue and finally brought him up to the surface. The anxious Jean saw them reappear, coughing and spluttering and dripping wet. Mary holding the twin aloft by a piece of his blue-trimmed jacket. 
As soon as Mary could get her breath and shake the water out of her eyes, she tumbled him back into the boat, and wrenching the tarpaulin from the stakes which had held it, she began to tow the boat back to shore. Jean splashed out to meet her and helped tow the boat in. When they ha- Then they had another valiant struggle, drawing it up onto the sand, but this time Mary drove the stake deep in the beach, a long way out of reach of the water, and anchored the boat securely with a piece of rope. Well, that's that, said Mary, blinking back tears of relief, and we're all safe. Oh, Mary, said Jean, I've learned more about tides today than I ever learned in school. I guess that isn't the last thing the island will teach us either. Now, you dry blue and keep an eye on the others while I see what I can do to dry myself. Just one darn thing after another, said Jean, and Mary was still so much excited that she forgot to remind Jean that she should never say darn.